I grab the serpent and we writhe on the ground in an epic struggle from hero and villain. The Demiswell D or the Damsel from There by Don Hamill Willowdale, a posthumous production. I do all the typical Paris tourist things. I visit the Eiffel Tower and the Arc du Triomphe, and I wait in the awful lines. I find the route to the Louvre, and determine to go there on Saturday, dimanche. I buy two baguettes for a discounted price, and eat them with gusto on a beautiful lawn in front of the River Seine. I laugh while I feed the stupid little ducks bits of my bread. Birds are so stupid. I find a decent market a few blocks from my new apartment, and a two-story cafe within walking distance. I decide to visit the cafe every morning to live out my dream of sophistication, and as I sip coffee overlooking a knobby cobblestone street, I make plans in my head to relish every day in this lifestyle and the sudden change of the course of my life. I toss a few euros into a cup of some blind man with a sarcastic sign reading C'est la vie. I sit on a stone hedge and reread my French language book. I practice all my talk about the weather phrases and argue about money statements. I practice exercising politeness so I can execute it when I meet my new boss for the first time. I breathe the pure air and skip along the roadways. I dream and dance and prance and make merry with every citizen that I meet. I fumble with my French words and I laugh to myself all afternoon. Four days later, my furniture and housings have not arrived. Without personal emotion, Claude tells me that I will have to start working tomorrow, but that the company would continue to provide me with room and board. Feeling the dullness of the city, I decide to venture out into the countryside. I take a long tour bus to Bretagne and awe at the purple heather landscapes and let my head become heavy with idle fantasies. I arrive at a rural stop and argue with the teller at the train station who is confused that I have no particular destination. I tell her that I want to hike into the wilderness, the Région Sauvage. She expresses some concern, but I pat my messenger bag and tell her that I am well prepared for a day trip. She sends me off with an impatient wave of her hand. The vast landscape of the French wild was confusing to me. Where I am from, we have grasslands with which one can trick using an accurate judgement of time and distance. These wilds, however, are full of long and short shrubberies with rocks and trenches dancing underneath. There are sudden drastic slopes and small crevices or canals all unseen because of interweaving of the purple flowers intermingled with the green and golden grass. It is beautiful and treacherous. Perfect terrain to sprain an ankle. The unexpected and hidden boulders or rocks beneath the uppermost visible field of wind-waving grasses force me to tread up and down, progressing slowly. I realise rather quickly that the landscape would not allow me to venture too deeply, but the sky has only a few sparse clouds revealing an infinite blue that beckons me forward. As the sun begins to wane lower and lower, I take a rest upon a large smooth boulder that protrudes above the sea of grasses. The clouds move slowly above an endless landscape of pure freedom. The wind blows through my hair and I drink some water. I feel so powerful. I feel like I can take on the world. I admire the vast and beautiful symphony of golden grass and purple flowers, spotted with occasional green stems and shafts of unripe wheat. I take this time to read some old book I picked up in one of the shops in Paris. It is the Greek philosopher Heraclitus, who is both at the same time interesting and boring. Surprisingly, another big gulp, and that's the last of the water. Suddenly I feel slightly less powerful, looking around. I am less sure of the exact direction I came from, although the sun does give me a little clue. I decide that I should press on and test the limit of my spirit in this wilderness. A lone and free grey hawk flies overhead and tempts me to continue forward, to free my spirit and live as he does. I walk on, identifying a far-off tree as my ultimate destination. 
I come to a sharp slope. The grass is lame, and I find myself walking amongst mostly rocks. Slowly, as I venture, my focus of what I thought was only a tree reveals in its thicket some sort of veiled statue. It is a statue of a woman. It stands amongst some slanted rocks where the terrain gets rough. Once the statue has my attention, I find myself walking quickly and distractedly, and I make an effort to get to the base of the statue so I can inspect it and understand it. Deeply, I am hoping that it will be the capstone of my journey so I can turn around and go home. She is beautiful. She stands tall on a slightly slanted slope of rocks riddled with those beautiful purple heather and white flowers. She is exactly as tall as a real young woman, which is deceiving at a distance because she seemed to be such a tall beacon. Her face is sharp and she is clothed in antique garb. She holds on her arm a perfect sculpted replica of a falcon. She stands there proud, yet delicate. Most of her is covered in orange lichens or green moss. In my preoccupied mind, I push past shrubbery and grass with haste, and I slip on a moss-covered rock. I soar towards the ground and fall onto my face, barely catching myself with my hands. I feel an urgent and disturbing pain in my ankle as I lay at the foot of the statue. I take stock of my surroundings. I lay on my face, with my pack strung around my neck, and my arms forced against a piece of granite. Suddenly, from the shadows of the foliage, a snake slithers into view. The snake is shockingly beautiful. It has a dark, greenish-blue head with disproportionately large, dark, yellow eyes that yield deep, black slits. The glistening scales transition color along the length of the serpent from deep blue to green, and finally to yellow at the very tip of its tail. Its scales are a veritable color wheel. It hisses at me with malice, and my stomach drops. I soon realize that the snake is intent on moving forward, as if it were going home after a long day and its den lies directly behind me. Terrified, I try to shift my body out of its way. This causes the snake to coil up into a striking position and screech an unholy tune. I decide to be still and silent, hoping that the serpent's aggression will pass. There is a long and solemn moment between me and the snake, and then the dark blue head strikes towards my back and I witness its long white fangs emerge like desperate flags on a battlefield. Suddenly, a gloved hand snatches the snake and grasps it hard by the neck. Bewildered, I look up and there is a young woman, as beautiful as the statue, wrangling the snake. She forces the mouth of the serpent onto a jar with a rubber top, its tail flailing violently in vain. Venom ejects out of those wicked fangs and into the empty glass like water filling a cup. Then she beheads the snake with a knife on a flat stone, and holsters the jar into a strap on her waist. The yellow-brown liquid jostles about. On the ground, the snake head writhes before my eyes with an involuntary biting jaw. For a moment, its yellow eyes look directly into mine, before they go blank. The woman extends her other, ungloved hand and hoists me up and untangles me from my strapped pack. She wags a finger at me and speaks in the thickest and most formal French I have ever heard. She speaks in a rustic and romantic way that is very different from the citizens of Paris. Her French is so fast that I can't understand most of what she says. She is a curious girl. She has long skirts with leather straps and metal clasps, and she has jingling bells about her clothes. Most of her brown hair is covered by a brightly colored scarf she wears long leather boots and leans on a knobby twisted walking stick. Her eyes are dazzling and bright, yet fierce, and her face and lips are pursed with a judging glare. She is, overall, very dirty, and looks as if she's been out in this wilderness for days, yet she smells like beautiful lavender. Je vois que vous avez raconte ma grand-mère. She says, while gesturing to the lovely statue, and smiles an even lovelier smile. Grandmother, I gasp. That's your grandmother? She looks at me puzzled and cocks her head slightly to the side. Then she gives me a full look over for the first time. She clicks her tongue in disapproval. Vous êtes Maria dans ce désert. Allons-y. She beckons me to follow her and starts off towards the sunset. 
My protest is met with a wave of her hand. I hesitate for a moment, but I know I won't get very far on my own. My ankle is bitterly swollen and cannot support my weight. I can't walk fast enough to reach civilization before dark. She supports me when the terrain gets rough, which is practically the whole time. She would nimbly bounce over a boulder and then spin on her heel and extend her hand to me. She talks often, and I don't understand much of what she says. In fact, I find that she talks a lot. She talks the whole way. At dusk, her hawk returns. Voila, mon faucon, she declares. It is a beautiful grey hawk with a dead mouse in its beak. She cuts off a little foot and feeds it to the hawk who swallows it in one bite. Then she hangs the mouse from her leather belt around her waist next to the jar of venom, jingling many of her bells. She has a backpack, which I barely noticed because of her heavy dresses and fabrics, and inside is an old-fashioned lantern with a candle and a shiny metal casing to reflect the light forward. She lights this with a spark from her knife and a stick of flint, and we travel the rest of the way much slower and not much quieter. She talks about falconry, hunting, dogs, mead, gardens, shoes, and all about her inheriting her grandmother's estate. Her house is easy to see on the horizon in the dark because of a well-lit fire in the main room, although one could hardly call it a house. It is a veritable stone castle from the Middle Ages, although not as big. It is surrounded by a waist-high stone fencing and a wide perimeter. The dark grey stone walls loom above me, about three stories up. The main door is heavy oak with metal fringe and casing. There is a large iron knocker with an insignia designated with two falcons with outstretched wings encircling the phrase D, a family crest. Inside are four men sitting in a large room. They are strong men with the same gypsy-esque clothes, with long hair and beards of different colours. Each one has a dog as diverse as they are. All the men stand to their feet and rush to the young woman. They say her name over and over, Malori. I catch only some of what they say, but they are mostly surprised that she has stayed out so late when tomorrow was Sunday. They give her kisses and hugs while they express relief and concern at the same time. One man with straight dark hair, the shortest one, takes the jar of venom from her and carefully, almost ritualistically, delivers it to a cabinet full of herbs and other types of containers. The red-bearded man carefully takes the hawk from the girl and places blinders on its eyes and delivers it to another five hawks, all perched quietly on wooden planks at the other side of the room. Another man beckons the girl to the table and pours her a cup of tea next to a plate of bread and cheese. They help her with her pack and dote on her like a queen. The men don't even notice me. I stand amazed at the scene before me. These gypsies live like Amish people. I don't see a single electric device or even a semblance of modernity of any kind. Large hand-cut wooden beams make rafters above me. They have rugs made from furs and skins. The dogs occupy themselves eating bones from some unknown animal and now a new mouse. There is a rack of old-fashioned gunpowder rifles on the wall with horns full of powder hanging over the edges of the rack. They live a very old-fashioned lifestyle, but everything is of fine quality and craftsmanship. <coughs> Bonne nuit, I say after clearing my throat loudly. The tallest man has a knife in my face in the blink of an eye. It glistens brightly in the firelight. All eyes are on me now. No, no, no! Ne sois pas tes marais! Fou, fou, fou! The girl shrieks at the man. She had just taken her boot off and hits him on the head with it several times. She chases him into the corner. He sheathes his knife and plops down onto a chair. He makes an obscene gesture at me and drinks heavily from a metal gourd. She brings me to the main table and declares, Voila, mes frères. They are her brothers. She names each man one by one. The tall one with the yellow beard is the oldest, Hastur. He grunts when his name is called and pats his dog's belly. Claude has a long and extravagant moustache, and he greets me with a warm and strong hug and then cuts me some bread to eat. Raoul is the short man with dark hair. He greets me with a Roman handshake and piercing eye contact. Bah, 
mostly tends to the hawks and gives me a wave of his hand. She catches herself once she realizes that she doesn't know my name. Bonjour, uh, je m'appelle Philippe, I say promptly. Je suis un néo-zélandais. I detail a brief apology about my lack of French-speaking proficiency and how my main language is English. Pasteur spits a little mead back into his gourd. Malachie stares at me with her beautiful mouth slightly open. I have never met the Neo-Zélandais, she says with broken English and a thick accent. But we can all speak English here if it makes you feel more at home. She smiles and the brothers agree, although some are not happy about it. The night ends with Malachie and I eating and talking deep into the night at the table by the fire. The brothers exit one by one upstairs and to different parts of the house. Her and I laugh as we talk about our hopes and dreams and our fears. The fire dies on its own. Holding a torch from the fire, she leads me to my bedroom and then disappears into her own chambers. I lie comfortably in dreamy bliss and let sleep take me like a little child. I awake to the piercing sound of a cock crowing just as a golden bead of sunlight beams through a misty horizon. There are no curtains in my window. In fact, there isn't even a window pane, just a crafted hole in the stone wall. My bed is made with feather-filled pillows and coarse sheets along with animal skins. I look under the mattresses and am tickled to see tightened ropes in the wooden frame, just like some old-timey movie. I bathe in a washtub with cold water. My twisted ankle rejoices in what seems like ice water, but the rest of my body screams in agony. After the bath, I examine clothes laid out for me. They look like a costume from a Shakespearean play. I feel a little weird putting them on, but I don't want to appear an ungrateful guest. I spare my pride by not wearing the little hat, and I walk downstairs looking like a real French falconer. It is a cold morning, but there is no fire, nor is there any talking. All five of the strangers sit in the main room, some cuddled up with dogs or under furs. I greet them pleasantly, and am met with cold stares. Astaire gives the gesture like, What gives? And Marie flies from under many fur skins and encourages me to go outside with her. She shoes away her excited dog, and we walk out the big wooden door. We walk along the grounds of the small castle, and she explains that today is the Sabbath. Therefore, we cannot work, and we should barely speak. We should instead ponder our existence. I vaguely mention about how I need to leave and return to my new job. But she waves it away and declares that we will not travel today. I accept it. After all, she is great company. We spend the morning outside. We pluck and eat raw tomatoes from a large and beautiful garden. She crosses herself and takes a bite so big it squirts all over both our faces. We sit in the grass and let the sun warm our bodies. We touch hands and examine each other's eyes. She remains reverent and mostly silent. I find myself doing most of the talking, opposite of our first meeting. At one point, she kisses me and then turns red like the tomatoes. She runs away. I follow her, and she hops onto the stone wall on the outer perimeter. She gracefully balances on the wall with outstretched arms and walks playfully along. I walk slowly alongside her on the ground, not sure what to say. My ankle feels better, but I take it easy. With struggling English, she says, That serpent would kill you? Il est venomous. It is uh, venomous. It means certain death. You are lucky to be saved, Bama. Raoul is working on the cure, but he hasn't found it yet. I thank her sincerely, and then there is a long silence. Will you come back? She asks slowly, after a long while, folding over and almost losing her balance. What do you mean? If I take you to the city, you will come back and see me? Of course. 
My mind fast forwards time and tries to comprehend this strange new relationship and my new strange friend. Every day? She stops and stares down at me sternly and seriously with her bright eyes and her hands out to either side. I chuckle. Sure, yes, yes, I will visit you every day. I'm not even sure if I can keep such a promise, but how can I say no? Très bien. She jumps onto me and I catch her in my arms. We kiss deeply. The warmth of our lips touching outmatches the rays of sunshine beaming down on our exposed skin. I could live in this moment of time for all eternity. Malohi and her brothers are very Catholic. They cross themselves every time they eat, and this Sabbath day was spent without an ounce of work or labor. That night we listened to Raoul read scripture in Latin. I don't understand a single word of it, and the whole situation makes me uncomfortable. Ford warmly pats me on the shoulder and told me in a whisper that he doesn't understand it either, but his demeanor is genuine and reveals that he believes it even though he doesn't understand it. Raoul closes the big book and asks Claude to recite a lyric. Claude obliges and speaks thus. Mais je crois que je suis descendu en puits ténébreux en quel de soi Heraclitus est la vérité cachée. We end the night listening to Malachi singing with a most lovely voice. Chasser, chasser, chasser encore, qui te rosette j'entends. The next morning, I awake to the blasting of a horn before dawn. I spring to my window and look down. Auster is mounted nobly on a black horse and he blows the horn again. It is both loud and solemn. The dim light reveals the other brothers on horses and a circle of dogs. Barret has a large metal hoop outstretched with all the falcons rested upon it. He constantly utters soothing French words to the birds as he steadies his horse. Raster calls out ancient French recitations related to falconry, nobility, and bloodlines. Malachi bursts into my room and declares, Voilà, aujourd'hui is a hunting day, I mean, today is a hunting day. Chasse, chasse, chasse. Her dog is barking and jumping at her feet. I protest a little, declaring that today I need to return to my job and tell her that I don't know how to hunt. She grins a wicked and childish grin and, as if empowered by the gods above, declares boldly something I don't understand. There is a pregnant moment where my mind drifts between my obligations and her beckoning arms. Of course, I agree to go with her. She cheers and does a little dance with the dog and runs away down the hall. My ankle feels great after another ice water wash and I don the falcon's uniform again. Malachi is waiting for me at the door with a hug. All day we ride and hunt. The sky is bright and the golden scenery is like something from a movie. Malachi teaches me how to shoot a black powder rifle. First, you pour an exact amount of measured powder into the barrel. Then you place a piece of oiled cloth over the opening. You set the iron ball onto the cloth and stuff it down into the barrel using a metal rod. Next, you use a tiny ignitable cap to place on the hammer, which, when triggered, will slam down and create a spark that lights the gunpowder. The process is slow methodical, and simply meditative. I killed two hares and a fox. The night comes and we make camp out in the open starlight. The brothers tell animated stories of heroes and villains, victories and foibles. Claude turns out to be really funny. Aster encourages me to drink too much mead. Under the bright moon we all become comrades and allies. Malachi nuzzles into my body and falls asleep. Her lavender scent consumes me. I feel out of time and place, and yet completely, perfectly at home. We spend three days out in the French wilds. 
I learned that for Grant's listen and obey to the bells jingling on the hunter's body. I learned that they need to be nearly starved in order to hunt, and their reward for a kill is meagre. I learned that the bond between the hunter and his bird is serious and deep. The dogs are eager to hunt for man, but the alliance to the prideful Faucon is not so easily won. The bird would fly high into the air, circle about and then dive down upon its prey, and bring the corpse back to its owner. Its reward was a small scrap of meat. The falconer tames the bird and earns an eternal friend. I am exposed to traditions kept secret to outsiders, and the most ardent French tourist, which I humbly admit that I am, would never dream of discovering such a bounty of pure heritage. An historical museum could not contain the lessons I learned these days, and Romeo himself could not even entertain the idea of the newly formed passion I have developed for my dear Malohi. Upon return home, we skin many beasts. The brothers teach me how to peel hides from dead bodies and rub them with tannin and pin the hides onto walls surrounding a fire that will tan them. They have crafted a small smokehouse for smoking meat. It has a fire at the bottom which must be kept going at all times and a tall little chimney to release the smoke. We cut thin strips of meat and pin them to the walls of the chimney. These then heavily salted and stored in large barrels. More days passed while we prepared the skins and meat from the hunt. One evening, after long and heavy work, we gather in the main room to celebrate. We roasted all the meat that wasn't smoked, and we eat and drank heartily around a vibrant fire. We laugh and carouse and dance. Malachi sings again and falls asleep into my lap. I nearly forget that I have another life. And yet the burning responsibility consumes me. I don't sleep that night. After all, I have a job. In the morning, I declare that I must return to the city and I demand to be taken home. I offer thanks with all the politeness of a decent guest and insist that I have obligations that must be met. Malachi agrees to take me only if before we leave, I will go walking with her again. We walk next to the wall that she balanced so playfully on, now with somber and serious tones. We stop again to lay in the grass and look in each other's eyes. I give her promises of return, and I genuinely mean it. It's him, she says simply. She begs me to stay, and she cries. I love you too. I declare, and say nothing else. Just above her milky, soft skin, I see movement in the grass. There, above her beautiful, bright eyes, another pair of even more vibrant eyes with slits reveals themselves. In the cool, soft grass lies a deadly serpent with beautiful and colorful scales, and a head hovering above Malachi. I scream and plunge forward between her and the snake. I cover her body with my own, and I feel the strike, but I don't mind it. I grab the girl and fling her away from me, and feel another strike. The venom feels like a bad vaccination. I grab the serpent, and we writhe on the ground in an epic struggle, hero and villain. I suddenly awake as if from a dream. I take stock of my surroundings. I lay on my face, with my pack strung around my neck, and my arms forced against a piece of granite. Suddenly, the stone perimeter wall is an ancient ruin. Vines creep through the stones and the underbrush is thick. The small castle is nothing but a pile of ruin and rubble with stones at odd angles that camouflage into the Bretagne heather. The snake bit me on the back and cheek. I slowly lose various perceptions of the world around me. I sweat and twitch and cry a lot. I crawl, half dead to the beautiful statue of the woman with the falcon that lies before me. There is an epitaph at the base. In hazy and clouded vision, I read, Here lies a demoiselle Malachi Jondi, who died in her youth from heartache for the loss of a stranger, Philip. Year of our Lord, 1599. 
Upon the base of the statue lies a falconer's glove, still warm with the fragrance of lavender.